Hello and welcome to another episode of Envisioneering Exchange, the podcast where industry leaders discuss the most important topics in building and urban efficiency. I'm your host, John Sheff, Dan Foss is Director of Public and Industry Affairs. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Today's topic is building energy efficiency and its link to economic recovery and resilience. And we'll touch on a lot of topics, including the ongoing pandemic. And I'm really thrilled to be joined by Clay Nessler. Clay is the interim president of the Alliance to Save Energy, and he actually comes from Johnson Controls, where he serves as vice president, global sustainability and regulatory affairs. Since joining Johnson Controls in 1983, Clay has held a variety of leadership positions in research product development, marketing strategy, manufacturing, corporate sustainability, and regulatory affairs, both in the U.S. and in Europe. And he currently chairs the company's Global Sustainability Council. Clay, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, John. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Did I cover everything in that intro? I mean, you are uh, basically a legend in the industry, and we're really thrilled to have you here. Maybe if you give us a little background on the Alliance to Save Energy and uh, your key event, EE Global. Yeah, well, thanks. So since November, I've been the interim president of the Alliance to Save Energy, which is a 43-year-old energy efficiency advocacy group based in Washington, D.C. It is a bipartisan organization. In fact, we have 16 honorary board members, half Republican and half Democrat from both the Senate and the House of Representatives. We also have over 100 associate members, which range from private sector companies like Denfoss to utilities, as well as other organizations and think tanks. So basically heavily involved in advocating for federal policy, but also have run over the years a number of initiatives, most recently on energy productivity and systems efficiency. 50 by 50, which is a uh, vehicle efficiency initiative, and most recently, Active Efficiency Collaborative, which is an initiative to take efficiency from being component and static to being more dynamic and more systematic in its approach and the various multiple benefits that that encompasses. Yeah, I love that idea. I think we talk on here on this podcast a lot about transition from thinking about energy efficiency and equipment from a component based to more of a system and holistic use. So very cool stuff. Now, I had the pleasure of speaking on a panel at last year's EE Global and in the plenary discussion when the event was in Washington. Now, of course, with the pandemic, things are a little bit different this year. How is EE Global adapting to this new strange environment? Yeah, EE Global's well over a decade old, and we've held a number of conferences in the U.S., principally Washington, D.C., but also Copenhagen and uh, also Paris. But obviously, the coronavirus had different ideas. So we've transformed EE Global, which was a multi-day event, into a series of webinars. And those webinars um, started in the April timeframe. Our first one was the global release of the Energy Efficiency Indicator Study which Johnson Controls has sponsored and administered over the last 13 years. And we invited individuals from all over the world. We had folks from Canada, folks from Europe. We had folks from China and the U.S. all talking about both the trends in the energy efficiency indicator, but also exploring what impact we felt that the uh, coronavirus would have on investment in energy efficiency. We've had sessions about every two weeks. We've had one on flattening the curve using the familiar and troublesome coronavirus infections curve, uh, metaphor of flattening the curve, and making analogy to climate change and how we have to bend the curve on increasing carbon emissions around the world. We had one recently focused on the 3% Club, which is a coalition of organizations and companies which are supporting countries that commit to a 3% per year annual improvement in energy efficiency in aggregate. Some countries can do more, some countries can do less. This was announced at the UN Global Climate Summit a year ago. 
And we've got um, going on past a dozen countries now uh, signed on. In fact, Canada just recently, a week ago, announced they were joining the 3% Club. And then we've also started a series now on economic recovery and energy efficiency. We had a transatlantic war workshop or uh, a webinar where we had experts from the U.S. and Europe talk about lessons they learned from the Great Recession back in 2009, 2010, and what that could mean for the economic recovery we are facing now. And of course, as one would expect, the renovation of existing buildings, which creates so many local jobs and can provide many environmental and climate benefits, was a common theme between the U.S. and Europe there. And our most recent one was on accelerating the recovery focused on building efficiency, which is, I'm sure, a topic many of your podcasts focus on. Yeah, I mean, so many points to hit on there. And, you know, I just want to say EE Global is a great event. And when it gets back to its live format, it's going to be awesome. But I think that the way you guys have adapted to the pandemic and kind of doing this webinar series over a period of time, instead of trying to cram it into to the normal space, I think really, really fits well. And I hope actually you continue doing that when things, quote, get back to normal. Normal. But you touched on a ton of topics there. Uh, we'll kind of pick through them. But you mentioned energy efficiency. Obviously, we talk about how many jobs it creates, how it can help stimulate the economy. I don't think we're quite in that stimulation phase yet in the U.S. We're still in relief mode. But before we get to that, how is the pandemic affecting energy efficiency and buildings in general? And how do you think that's going to continue? And what are the lasting impacts? Well, two things come to mind. One is that in order to address the health risks of the coronavirus, ASHRAE, the uh, U.S. Engineering Society focused on heating, ventilating, air conditioning, refrigeration, the Centers for Disease Control, American Institute of Architects, various bodies have put out guidelines as to how to get facilities health and safe in light of the coronavirus. And the recommendations are fairly consistent. Increase outdoor air ventilation and ventilation effectiveness increase the amount of filtration. Many buildings have MERV 8 and 9 ratings, fairly the minimum amount of air filtration, basically catching rocks and birds, I think, (laughs) uh, from passing through the air handling units, as opposed to certainly addressing any virus and other contaminations. So the recommendations, you know, start at 11 and go up to about 13. In critical environments, there's the application of uh, HEPA filters, actually, which are used in hospitals and healthcare settings, isolation rooms and surgical suites. And they're now being applied in non-healthcare type facilities because of their effectiveness at actually trapping the uh, coronavirus. And then air treatment is starting to become popular. UVC um, has the ability to destroy many of the uh, uh, virus cells that may be in aerosols or airborne in a room. UVC can be applied in air handling units as kind of a kill tunnel, it's called, or they can be built into the spaces to irradiate surfaces in the air when the rooms are unoccupied or to circulate air through them um, so there isn't any visible UV light because it can be dangerous to eyes and cleanse the space. We're also learning that humidity has a really big effect on the coronavirus Mm. in two dimensions. One, we've always felt humidity was about comfort. And then if it was too high, it could create, you know, fungus and mold and things such as that. But it turns out the coronavirus transmission is much greater at low humidities. So the recommendation is uh, 40 to 60 percent relative humidity. And there's two factors. One is just the, um, the virus remains airborne in aerosol form at low humidities. And two, the human body reacts at low humidity by capturing more of the virus in the respiratory tract. So really, I think a lot of us in the industry have become, you know, sort of junior infection control. I wouldn't call us specialists, but certainly practitioners. The impact of all those is increasing energy use in general. More outdoor air requires, you know, uh, more conditioning of that air. 
increased filtration is greater pressure drops through the fan systems. Air treatment may in fact uh, have an impact as well. And we may be humidifying spaces in the northern part of the U.S., which would be typically at a low humidity. We may be raising the humidity and conditioning the space before occupied in order to minimize the uh, threat due to the coronavirus. So it's going to be a little challenging to meet both sustainability and health and safety guidance. One thing we're learning is that some of the technologies used to police social distancing and track whether people are too close to each other for too long, tracing and tracking software that actually counts people and their location, that may be a key to being able to manage both energy use as well as health in a facility. That same software, instead of there being a single occupancy sensor on a light switch in a conference room, can actually count the number of individuals. In fact, it can count the individuals throughout the occupied space. And being able to adjust ventilation providing greater than minimum ventilation per the guidelines, but perhaps not as much as you would expect in an overcrowded, fully occupied building, may be the key to optimizing both. So we see controls and sensing as being a critical tool to be able to improve the safety and the efficiency of buildings. Yeah, I mean, there's so much there that you mentioned, but first of all, I'm glad you went through some of the key things we can do to make these spaces safer, because there is a lot of misinformation about there, particularly about HVAC. But, uh, you know, a well-functioning HVAC system with some of these upgrades, bringing in more outside air, better filtration, and then maybe some devices to actually clean the air can really have a big impact. And it's not necessarily the HVAC system that is uh, spreading the disease. So I'm really important there. But like you said, I think some of these techniques are going to be at odds with energy efficiency, and we're going to have to learn how to deal with that and, um, you know, bringing more data. And I do think that variable speed technology is going to be play a big part because like you said, we're going to have more data. We're going to understand who's exactly in the space and being able to ramp up and down and bring in outside air is going to be a big benefit as opposed to some of these on-off systems that have been installed. So I really can see a big uptick in some of this really new variable speed technology entering places where it hasn't been before. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So we talked about how energy efficiency can play an impact, play a role in, in kind of getting the economy back on its feet. I think in the US here, we're still in relief mode and not stimulus mode, but other countries are starting to put packages together that include some of the green technologies. What are you seeing in some of these other places like Europe and maybe even Asia? Yeah, Europe across the EU has aligned their economic recovery with their green initiative, the Green Deal. And a key component of that is something called the Renovation Wave, which is essentially a program to significantly increase the rate at which existing homes and buildings are renovated. We're talking from a renovation rate, which has dropped to perhaps less than 1% per year to something um, more in the 2 to 3% year range. And of course, the IEA and other organizations have suggested that in order to be able to meet the Paris Accord targets and to put us on a clear path to decarbonize the economy by 2050 and maintain a one and a half degree world, energy efficiency is the primary tool that we should be using. Using available technologies, which are cost effective, actually provide a return. So they're an investment and not a cost that policies such as incentives or requirements for building renovation can do a lot of the heavy lifting towards meeting those climate and sustainability goals. And here in the U.S., we very quickly hit over 400,000 energy efficiency workers out of work. A lot of reasons for that. One is people can't go into people's homes during the coronavirus and do audits. They can't make improvements in homes that uh, require, you know, work in the space. Uh, A lot of audits of other types of facilities have been put on hold. So out of all the energy jobs, clean energy jobs in the U.S. are the largest segment, more than 
oil and gas and other fuels. And within the clean energy segment, the majority of jobs are actually in energy efficiency. So this is where things kind of line up and what's good for the environment and can improve the health and safety of those facilities, as well as the comfort and wellness they can provide to building occupants, also is a great economic stimulus. I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of reasons to do a lot of these retrofits in homes and in commercial buildings, but they just don't get done. And there are a lot of reasons for that. What are some of the biggest challenges to meeting those goals in existing buildings? So the biggest challenge in retrofits has been the upfront capital required to make it. We know that energy efficiency pays for itself over its time. So it's not really a cost, it's an investment, actually with a very good return on investment. But You know, capital, lots of competition for precious capital. So despite low interest rates and ready access to capital, many organizations decide to use it for other things. The models that help are like energy savings performance contracting, which um, started in 1985 in the state of Ohio in K-12 schools that wanted to upgrade their lighting and their controls, but couldn't enter into a contract for more than a year. So they invented something called performance contracting, which would pay for those savings over time. And a prime contractor would come in and not only make the improvements, but guarantee the results. That's now a five, six billion dollar market, primarily focused on public buildings, including the U.S. federal government. There are other models. We know that power purchase agreements have been wildly successful with renewable energy, putting solar PV on the roofs of both homes and commercial buildings. There's an analogous model for energy efficiency called efficiency service agreements or energy service agreements, where a third party basically comes in, implements an improvement, and that improvement is paid over time. The building owner pays a costs that would be similar to if the improvement hadn't been made and the energy savings goes to the organization that put the upfront capital up for the improvement there. We also have PACE. Commercial PACE allows commercial building owners to pay for improvements through a surcharge on their property tax. The advantage of that is in commercial office buildings, property taxes are passed through to tenants. So this solves the dilemma between who pays the utility bill and who pays for the improvements. So those models are very effective in the U.S. and could definitely scale up given greater demand for retrofits. And yeah, I think you're going to see in the future, especially in commercial real estate, the pandemic's putting such pressure on them. And there are also a lot of new regulations in some key markets like in New York and DC. But I think that you're going to see more commercial real estate try to get past what you talked about, the split incentive there between tenants and landlords and really crack that and unlock a lot of the value in their building. So something to keep an eye on. I also think utilities could play a role there in the future too, particularly with some of these uh, power purchase agreement-like entities that you're discussing. But to talk about cities a little bit, you know, we have talked about what New York and DC are doing in this space and some of their building emissions laws. Can you talk a little bit about the impact there and what other cities in the US and maybe some other parts of the world are doing? Yeah. So uh, very excited about the new building performance standards that have been first introduced in Washington, DC, which is my home base at this point. And uh, most notably, at a larger scale in New York City, they've basically taken a great idea, which was benchmarking and transparency, the ability or the requirement to have building owners, typically larger commercial buildings and multifamily buildings, benchmark their facility using the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. I'm not sure it was always thought this way, but the path seemed to be you need to benchmark your building. You need to have that data available when you sell your building. You need to publicly report that data. You need to basically do some other policy initiatives, such as retro commissioning, implementing short payback improvements, have audits of your facility. And the next wave is to actually add the stick to the carrot which is to make requirements so that buildings below a certain rating level in Energy Star Portfolio Manager are required to make improvements. And I know in our energy efficiency indicator research, benchmarking, 
transparency, certifications like this, labeling, was the number one driver of investment in energy efficiency. So I think you're now seeing cities, and in one case, a state, adopting these building performance standards is going to drive significant retrofit opportunity. In the city of New York alone, they're expecting something on the order of $20 billion will be required to bring those buildings up to the requirements by 2029. That's about a 13 times greater rate of renovation than we're currently seeing in New York City. And the the law has some real teeth in it. If you choose not to make the improvements and your building emits too much carbon, and it is based on carbon, not just energy, DC's program is based on energy use, but New York's is based on carbon. So the fuel that's used to provide heating, the source of the energy, that makes a difference. And you pay a penalty, which can be hundreds of dollars per ton of carbon if the minimum targets are not met. That's enough money to make a CFO wake up and weigh the difference between investing in energy efficiency and getting their building out of the danger zone and paying a very, very large penalty. So that's going to drive efficiency for sure. And yeah, and like I said, I think that some of those policies are going to drive efficiency and retrofits. They're also going to drive innovation in these business models. I'm really excited to see what comes out of New York in particular, but also DC and how the industry kind of adapts to these new policies. Many other cities as well, I might add. You know, Boston is considering a similar policy. I believe St. Louis is the first Midwestern city to implement. So This is going to move across the country, much like benchmarking did a number of years ago. So huge trend and critically important to drive investment in energy efficiency. Yeah, definitely. And I'm really looking forward to see, again, what innovations come out there. Let's change gears a little bit and talk a little bit globally. Sustainable cooling is kind of a buzzword that we've heard thrown around, particularly in our industry, but in the efficiency industry in in general. Can you kind of explain what that means and what the trend is? It's actually a very important concept and one that is in some ways not obvious. As more and more countries develop, as more and more countries urbanize, as more and more of their population in emerging areas enter the middle class, one of the things that's on the top of the list is investing in air conditioning, okay? A cell phone would logically be first, and but closely behind that is actually being able to provide a healthy, comfortable environment for the family, and that involves usually going to a local retailer and buying a air conditioning unit, which is installed by the family <laughs> and provides cooling into the space. Unfortunately, a lot of these air conditioners barely meet the minimum efficiency requirements. And in some countries, there are no minimum efficiency requirements for these air conditioners. So what you see is the potential over a relatively short period of time, the energy used to power these air conditioners could double or more. A more efficient air conditioner obviously provides the same level of comfort or better and uses a lot less energy. As much of that energy and electricity is coal-based or fossil fuel-based, that's what contributes to global warming. There's another unique aspect of air conditioning is the refrigerants used in air conditioners are, in fact, a global warming pollutant. It's called a short-lived climate pollutant in that it has a very strong and near-term impact, many times greater often than carbon dioxide. People talk about carbon emissions. Um, Refrigerants can have many, many times, hundreds of times or higher the amount of global warming potential as carbon dioxide, which we all know to be a global warming substance. So a climate-friendly cooling solution is one which would have very high efficiency and would use an ever-decreasing environmentally impacting refrigerant consistent with the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. So the goal is to influence the two dimensions, efficiency and the global warming potential of the refrigerant. 
But why it's a useful concept is doing one and not the other has a very limited impact. In fact, it would potentially be environmentally poor to give up efficiency of the equipment in order to use a lower GWP refrigerant. That's because given the current nature of electric grids around the world, enough carbon is emitted in producing the electricity to power the air conditioner that it could have greater indirect emissions than the very low leakage rate and loss of the refrigerant chemical itself, which is a direct emission. So it's very important to do both choose lower GWP refrigerants, as well as improve the efficiency of the equipment. There's even a prize, the Global Cooling Prize, which challenged innovators around the world to come up with a residential air conditioning system that would result in very significant improvement in both. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of cool innovation going on in that scene, but this sounds like a huge challenge, but also it's a huge opportunity, particularly in some of these developing countries, say India, where the infrastructure has not yet been built, you know, utilizing a shared system like district energy, and we've talked about this a, a few times on the show, can really have a big impact. And we talk about district energy in North America, it mostly means heating, but in other parts of the world, it can mean cooling too, right? Well, certainly in the Middle East, uh, not a lot of heating going on there, but an awful lot of cooling and an awful lot of buildings in major urban areas in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, in Qatar are actually served by district energy systems. And we tend to think of district energy systems as new. They're actually really old well over 100 years old in the United States. Mm -hmm. The International District Energy Association is one of the oldest engineering-oriented societies because that was the way you provided heating years and years ago. So I think we've seen a resurgence, actually, in district energy, maybe not at a New York scale where we uh, convert waste into steam and run steam underneath the Manhattan, but we see it an awful lot in institutional settings, whether that be large college campuses, whether that be large healthcare complexes, whether that be large military or federal installations. And there's a number of advantages of doing that. We know that we need to decarbonize the built environment, but frankly, renewable energy has increasing economies of scale, if we can apply it, where we have plentiful land area, plentiful space, and we can combine infrastructure. There are a lot of vertically challenged buildings, which are tall enough that they don't have the roof area to be able to provide significant amounts of renewable energy to buildings. But taking a collection, a community, if you will, a district of buildings, and then serving that with shared renewable energy sources, as well as district heating, cooling, and power, is a very economic, scalable, and resilient approach. Many of these organizations that are put in these systems um, are able to island their operations. When the grid goes down, their combined heat and power plants can provide power. And uh, this is where the controls in the buildings can turn off non-critical loads, very similar to a demand response type of event to minimize the electrical demands for those facilities and keep them resilient, whether it be a grid outage in the Northeast due to a polar vortex, or whether it be a severe weather event that shuts down power for a period of time. District energy of both the renewable electron form as well as the heating and cooling form is a great approach to both reduce energy, improve resilience, and it has a very positive impact on climate. And yeah, and I think it gets back to kind of what we were talking about at the very beginning of the show, looking at a system-based approach instead of looking at a building as a discrete system, looking at a district as that system and buildings as components within it and trying to utilize resources more efficiently. So I think it's really cool. Clay, 
that's about as much time as we have. I really appreciate you being here. Do you have any last thoughts? Only one last thought. We've been talking about district energy, and I just wanted to put in a plug for our one of our last webinars in the EE Global webinar series, which is going to be focused on district energy and its role in the economic recovery. So I hope many of your listeners will choose to register for our EE Global webinar series. And I really appreciate you inviting me on today's podcast. Well, thanks, Clay. And that's it for this episode of Envision Earning Exchange. I'd like to thank Clay Nessler again for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to Envision Earning Exchange on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review and share it with your network. It really helps you out. Again, my name is John Sheff. I'm Director of Public and Ministry Affairs at Danfoss. And thanks for listening. Talk to you next time. This podcast is for information purposes only. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Envisioneering Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and not necessarily represent those of Danfoss LLC and its employees. Danfoss LLC is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. This podcast series does not constitute professional advice or services. This podcast, including Danfoss LLC and the producers, disclaim responsibility from any possible adverse effects of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and Danfoss LLC in this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility of statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about the guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of the Envisioneering Exchange podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website computer or playing device.